<laughs> so thank you guys. Thank you everybody for coming. My name is Joelle Moore, and I work with the um, Berlin Creative Industries. And our goal is to help artists and entrepreneurs in Berlin um, grow and increase their their business opportunities. We're doing that by um, a variety of teaching methods. If you look at, if you, all of you got a schedule back there, you'll see that we have a bunch of, um, <laughs> still got carrot in there. I think I'm spitting <laughs> it on you. Should have and, moved back a row. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got um, a lot of workshops coming up on grant writing, um, marketing, expanding your, your base. Um, and this is open to everybody and they're free. Uh, so I'm so, I, I feel so odd to be standing next to you, Paula. Why? <laughs> why? Um, Am I odd? You're odd. <laughs> That's why. Um, Paula um, is, uh, was born here and raised here in Berlin and is now like world famous, internationally, yeah. nationally um, famous artist. And today she's going to talk to us about the importance of art in public places. And I have a, can I share a little sure. anecdote yeah. Yeah. about the importance of art in public places? You might think, well, how can art help a community economically? How, how would it have an economic impact just because you have a mural? Or, Well, th this was my little experience. At the Art League, which is down the street, there was this really ugly, rusted post in the yard. It kind of looked like... Um, you know, a level that you, that has those little bubbles in the middle. It looked like that, that somebody had stuck in there and it had a hole in it and then it had a little wire come out with something round on the end. And I don't know what it was, it wasn't pretty. But last year, one of our members asked if she could paint it. So I gave her some turquoise paint and she went out there and painted it. And then she took her paintbrush and just stuck it in the hole at the top. And it, it, it brightened it up. Well, I found two hubcaps that somebody had spray painted, <laughs> so I added them to it. So now we have, so you guys have to check it out. There's two hubcaps and it's bright blue. It's got a paintbrush stuck in it. Well, all of a sudden this weird phenomenon started happening and not once, not twice, but over and over, we would have people come into the gallery. We would always ask people, oh, where are you from? Do you live here? Have you been in here before? Repeatedly, these people said, I've lived here all my life. I've just never been in here before. Or, oh, I've been here 25 years, but I never noticed you before. And what I believe was happening is because we had brightened it up with that little piece of public art, it was catching the eye of people. Maybe, maybe it was even kind of a subconscious thing. They were going, wow, this is cool. So I think art <laughs> in the public eye is important, and you're going to tell us why now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, it's really nice to see some familiar faces, and I'm excited to talk about public art. It is a genre of art um, that includes all types of art that we see in you know, other, other spheres, like the gallery world, the museum world, even private worlds. And it is something that has been around ever since humans first started making art, which is really interesting too. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so I, I, I appreciate, Joelle, your sort of like uh, establishing a theme for what, I, what I'd like to present. And it is something that is very important and I think very accessible to all of us to bring more attention to our beautiful community of Belen. And um, at the end of the talk, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna sh talk about some specific things that we can do. Thank you. So I just wanted to share briefly a little bit about myself. Hey, how are you? Tony. Oh, sorry, <laughs> so this, uh, the image up here that you're seeing is actually a piece I'm working on right now for the city of Denver. And um, it's called Equis, and it's for the Denver Museum Art Campus. There's a total of 
two other, three, three pieces total that I'm doing for the city of Denver, for their art campus. And the city of Denver, their call for art, wanted something, some, a story that had never been told about Denver. And so this is part of that story. Um, I'm gonna click on my website here just to take you into a couple of other things that I do. This is a, a, a show I did up in Santa Fe. This is actually another public work I did that I'll talk a little bit more actually down here in Belen and, and throughout the whole state of New Mexico. It's a temporary work. And this is the Denver Commission. So there's three pieces. And the story that I told about the city of Denver that had never been told before in, a, in the public sphere was about the remarkable uh, mestizaje or Chicano Indo-Hispanic overlay of the development of the city of Denver. And so I used um, translations of Mesoamerican iconography like this piece. It's called Shikakoliwaki. And um, it represents a long history of public work for both Mesoamericans and the city beautiful beautification project that happened in our country in the, in the 19th century. And then this is Equis. This, is, um, this piece represents the, the intersection of European language with Mesoamerican Nahua language. And then this last piece is called the trestle, and it represents um, a contemporary um, Mexican overlay of the city of Denver, which was the, the development of the railroads and the workers who, who helped build those railroads, which then inadvertently made Denver the city that it is today. So I wanted to start today with kind of a, a an introduction, by way of introduction, but I also wanted to talk about public art. And because I know a lot of you here today are artists, I wanted to engage in a very streamlined type of critique for art. Um, a lot of times I think we think of criticism in art as judgment, like, oh, that's awful. Oh, I don't like that, I like that. It's actually engaging with the work to try to understand uh, what it's about, how it makes us feel, what it was made from. So I thought we would do this. I have three pieces, let's see, three pieces I want to share with you today. And these th this is the first one, it's called Now. They're all, they actually all um, were installed in New York City this last year in 2023. And they're considered to be some of the best public art in America last year. And I thought it would be interesting to show something that's not here in, in the Southwest region just to give us some objectivity about it. So, this is the first piece now, it's called. This is the second piece. It's called um, The World's Unfair. And you may not think of this as public art. And then the third piece, this is called Scratching the Back Drift. And this is, this is installed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This one is um, installed in Queens, New York at the site of, of the World's Fair in 1939 and 1964. And this one is installed at the New York State Supreme Court building. So you get to pick when you introduce yourself, which one you wanna talk about. And so the requirements are, you just have to say, you have to answer this question, who am I? And then you can pick all of these questions to answer or one or two. What do I see? What do I think the artist's intention were? And I'll remind you if you forget, how was it made? And how does it make me feel? Okay, who wants to go first? Tony? <laughs> Tony! I'll go first. Okay, which one would you like, sir? <laughs> My name is Tony. Um, I'll go with that one. Okay. The first one. So, it's the gold one? Is that the... That's correct, yes. So, it would... What I see is that the state Supreme Court building has been historically represented by a white guy in a robe. And that's the other statue over there. And now, is that what it's called? It's called now. Now, yes. we have a not white guy and not in a robe. So it's different and difference. 
I think. And I think there's something to be said for it's not like it used to be in a positive way. Because I know that how it makes me feel is when I was growing up, there were a lot of things in the 70s and the 80s that were okay to say and okay to do that are not okay to say and okay to do now. And I think that's better. I think that's progress. I think we as a community of humans have become more aware and more conscious, and that's what that means to me. Thank you, Tony. Totally. You did perfectly. Thank you so much for being our first example. Okay, who would like to go next? Kathy? <laughs> Okay. Hi, Kathy. I'm the director here. The world is unfair. So, <laughs> it's interesting because it's made out of very simple things that we're all familiar with. Like, you can imagine the white picket fence being kind of a nostalgic thing, and yet it's surrounding something that somebody wants back, or there would be the picture of give it back. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I find it an interesting juxtaposition of a challenge, spiky, sharp. I think of, what was that Hitchcock movie about skiing? <laughs> North by Northwest. Um, <laughs> but then also this, this sense of, well, there's some piece of all of us in that. The, the nostalgia and comfort we feel about a white picket fence can be very different if you were on the other side of that. Thank you, Kathy. I also piggyback on that. Kathy, that's the right word. That you have to introduce yourself. Oh. <laughs> okay. Who you always just have to answer the question, who am I? Who am I? No. Um, <laughs> my name is Katie Raven, second one made up, uh, Hernandez Dorsey, and that's my name. Who I actually am is this conglomeration. <laughs> conglomeration of, um, I'm a military grad. I've moved, lived all over the, wor the, the world, kind of, more or less. Anyways, I'm still having some identity crisis. But so to me, the picket fence is uh, super domestic. Um, and so to me, I know I'm like, why? Because I saw you. Um, to me, it represents like the American dream. Um, of course, as a woman, the white picket fence back in the day, and I think it still is like this, um, this thing we're supposed to have, you know, supposed to do. <gasps> I don't know. You, you can go on. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Yeah, I don't know. I'm super emo. No. Well, it's it is amazing how I, I, I'm always I'm always so profoundly moved by how talking like art to me is almost like a tool for humans to navigate where we're at and where we're going. So thank you for, for allowing that in this space. I appreciate it very much. Bob, do you want to go next? Sure. Do you want to do, do you want to go move on to another one or? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sophia, get ready. You're going to be called on. <laughs> uh, I'm Bob Dorsey, Katie's husband. Yeah. Um, I also studied art and uh, so I'm always drawn to these public art pieces, good or bad, really, you know, like you said, Joelle, that, that piece, you know, whatever anyone thinks of it, um, it brought them there to discover, to investigate it or whatever. So I, I do love, I can't really see it, the bottom piece is part of it as well. It's like another, it's an alternate view, and it, it's, it does not look, it's not very clear right there, Bob. Sorry about that. Well, it's, um, I do like the, uh, when I look at it, um, next to those big columns, those iconic, you know, massive columns there in, in, uh, in that classical Greek or Roman, whichever they are, Corinthian, I, I don't know. But, uh, but th this very geometric, uh, very modern piece with a, with a little twirling, appendage coming out of it is, is really a nice contrast between these two things. Um, and it's unexpected where it's placed, I think. You know, to have something like that in between uh, that and in, in kind of a little window area there is uh, uh, unexpected. And so it's, it's uh, I get a good feeling of it because it, it almost feels like it's not supposed to be there. <laughs> and like somebody kind of went in and did it in the middle of the night and took off before they got <laughs> But it's a nice piece and uh, uh, it makes me feel good. <laughs> Very nice. Very and nice. I'm Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Uh, Sophia or Terry or someone else? Oh, yeah. 
piggyback off this because I want to talk about the same one. I'm Jim Rendy. I'm a retired architect and artist and farmer. And that's my world. The columns, the Corinthian, probably Corinthian columns, you have seen the top. But, and then that, that structure there, the, the piece of art itself, it's, it's so rigid and functional. And, of architecture it just looks like yeah it's there but it's just a square grid not too much imaginative really but what really caught my eye is that little red squiggle that comes out of the top and in my world if you're in that sterile environment such as some of those things represent you, you almost have to react to it and in that reaction this wonderful creativity usually comes out of it and that's what that little squiggle represents to me is the, the creativity that comes out of a sterile, functional uh, environment. And it's, it's just fun to me to see that little squiggly thing up there. That makes all the sense. The oh, very nice. Yeah. Nice observation. Thank yeah. you. Say, say your name one more time. It's Jim. J Jim. Jim. Thank you, Jim. Wait, you have to. Oh, yeah. Who am I? <laughs> do you want? And you want to do this? You would like to do this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Mary Swenson, and I'm the president of the Friends of the Library. Um, what I'm seeing here is that we have the old classical, you know, and we have new modern art, and this red thing that Jim talked about looks to me like. One of the two of them is giving the other one an infusion. Okay, is it the is it the new uh, modern art giving an infusion to something that's been there for so long and is old and needs needs an infusion, or is it the classical giving an infusion mm -hmm. to the modern? Very nice. I like I like the discussion about how how everything is related and connected in some way. Thank you, Mary. Joel. Well, I saw that Sophie had her hand up, and I wanted to hear what she had to say. My name. My okay. name is Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Uh, I liked the first one. Okay, I'm going to go back to it. I thought you would. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, it makes me feel happy. I enjoy seeing beautiful women. <laughs> and I think we should have more art like that. But I do agree with him saying how it shows like how we've changed as a society throughout the generation throughout generations and a lot of people see that like negatively, but I think it's I think this piece really shows how a beautiful woman can still be regarded as like smart and like equal to that other guy now. And I really I really like this one. <laughs> Could you talk just briefly about how you, how your, your experience of how people see this negatively? Like, I feel like, 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 like usually more attractive women or beautiful girls are seen like as like dumb or like disregarded. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this piece not only shows her beauty, but also that she's like an intellectual, just like the old guy sitting next to her. And I like that. Uh, yeah, I just like that she. I honestly like that she's in gold too, and it emphasizes her, and it shows like growth. I don't know. Thank you, Sophia. The lotus flower. Base oh yeah, that is a lotus flower. Yeah. My name is Joanne, and I was kind of thinking back on this too because I was thinking of the same thing about you know like this new age, especially I'm like, uh, into astronomy and astrology a little bit. We have this new age of Aquarius, which is like this new era. And we're like stepping into, especially as women, we're starting to really come up and, you know, and, and take part in society and have good, um, you know, be good role models for people. And, you know, the lotus flower does mean new beginnings. And the fact that she's in gold and Especially in the legal system, you know, where men were traditionally um, the rulers and the narratives of, you know, of law, and now we have these women that are 
also stepping up and having a new perspective on things and um, some quality. Thank you. Can you say your name one more time? I'm so Joanne. sorry. Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. <coughs> Is it bronze cast? Uh, I don't think so. And we're going to talk. I'm going to. I'm going to give you some information about each one after everybody goes. Yes. I also think it's a. Is it hair or? Uh, <coughs> I don't want to say beast, but like. I think that that empowers the figure even more. Like, you know, yeah, horns or hair, but also I love that her, her hips, you know, that she's kind of empowered by the natural female figure, not the female figure that we see in Vogue or in any kind of media, you know. So that also I think is very empowering that she really represents an actual woman, not uh, this ideal that most most people, most women, cannot actually attain. So, Katie, you're correct. There are no arms on her, so there's. It's almost like, for lack of a better word, like tentacles coming out. Okay, so coming that out that out looks like arms. part of part of the hair yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think it's very empowering. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm Mars. Mar Mars? Mars. Mars. And could we go to the second one, please? Yes. And this one, you know, you see the white picket fence, <coughs> not so tall in the background, which seems like, you know, it's a fence that can't be scaled because it's so high, it's leading up to that point. And in the front, very front, you have the little garden fence that can easily be stepped over. But then you have these spikes, they're almost like a, it's like a something from wartime. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not allowing you to go into this area, but it's inviting in different ways and different narratives because of the white picket fence and the, just the structure. And then to give it back, you know, it's almost like you can't. You can't take it back because you're prevented from going in there. So, you know, who's saying give it back? You know? Good question. <laughs> the artists are, I mean, it's yeah, their message, yeah. And I'll talk about wh who, who created this. But those are, those are good observations. Yeah. And I, 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 Janice, Janet, Janet, Janice. Yes, Joanne. I'm so sorry. I'm, I am such a visual person. I, I, names for me so it's hard initially. And I wanted to add. I did. I didn't want to reveal too much about this, but I think I'm going to because you did talk very beautifully about um, the history of women in the justice system, especially in the 20th century. I mean, you know, Ruth Bader. Ginsburg was uh, a Supreme Court justice, you know, for a long time, and this literally is the first time a woman was put on in this area, and it's actually temporary, which is interesting too. So it's that's my guess too that it's not Katie, that it's not bronze. It's some material that was uh, it wasn't funded. It was it was. I mean, there's some there were some small grants associated with this, but okay. Thank you, Mars, for that. Joel, I'm Joel, and I'm not going to talk about. Any of those pictures? Okay. What I'm going to talk, what I'm going to comment on is how, when I hear everybody's um, thoughts or reactions to these different art pieces, that piece of art becomes more important to me. It becomes like, like when Jim was talking about that, the architect one, you know, it's kind of dry and yeah, I can see the little windows and doors. And, but then when, when Mary started talking about it as an infusion of energy and not knowing, it just gave me a whole different view of it. And I think that's, what I've noticed is that when we talk about art, when we um, look at a piece and discuss it, that piece becomes more important. It becomes living in a way. And so like that one little piece that Mars was just talking about with the fence, it's like, yuck, 
But then as Mars started talking about it, now I now I'm more interested in learning uh -huh. about it. Yeah. And that's what I had to say. And I think that goes along with what you were saying when you, in, when, when you introduced this, this particular workshop, is that that's the, that is the beauty of public art, um, that everyone, I mean, certainly when you go into a museum, you're allowed your opinion, but it's, there's still like a, it's still like a very narrow corridor. It's a very restricted space for looking at art, whereas in the public realm, it's everybody's, and everybody has a right to think something or, or be moved in, in a particular way that is all legitimate. And it's like, I, I call it a coffee shop moment. Public art creates coffee shop moments of if, if it is done well and if, it, if it's placed in an area where people can actually encounter each other in ways that are not uh, polarized or siloed, they actually begin to share things about themselves in a more objective way that allow us to understand our, our sense of belonging together in a way that's very fluid and not like, doesn't have to stay static. So thank you for that, Joelle. Um, yes, Bob? Now after hearing the discussion of this piece a little bit more, this, this is one I was least interested in, but now I'm more intrigued by it, um, by Mars observations and, and um, and I'm now focused on the painting there, and I'm wondering if it's uh, the comment, maybe this was a natural place before we came in and created this big city and had the World's Fair in it and all that stuff. Maybe it was forest land, and, and, and maybe it's a Native American artist or something I'm asking. Yes, who yeah. Who was the artist? Yeah. And they want it yeah. back, like maybe restore it to its original yeah. you know, thing. It was the, the World's Fair, uh, and what was it before it was taken? Yeah. So I'm kind of thinking with fences and like Katie was saying, <laughs> starting to cry about fences. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping you out, dividing up things that were, there was no sign of anything before. And I'm wondering if that's kind of a comment with yeah. the artists. Yeah. Well, and having used picket fences a lot in, my, in the 90s with, my, with printmaking and painting and drawing, maybe, not like give it back like maybe we will never go back to that moment where very traditional the woman's at home with the children i mean that's not a bad thing but there were so many restrictions for her to move on or do something else like you were basically not not stuck or trapped but that picket fence also being such a um, icon for the perfect house the perfect yard, the perfect children and um you know like sophie said there's so many more things that we can do, that we do. So maybe as a, what was the word I was thinking of? Um, you know, it's like a romanticized version of how things used to be. And I don't know if it's give it back or don't go back. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. Terry, can I call on you? I think Joanne had her hand up. Oh. You were going to say something. Oh, sorry, thank you. Paul. Thanks, Terry. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Joanne. Thank you. It was interesting. I wanted to talk about this originally, but I didn't get it because it's where I'm, I'm from. I'm ah, from okay. I'm 10 minutes from, in this part of Queens, from the, the ah, fair. Okay. We were just talking, I was just talking to Mars about it the other day. Wow. And what's interesting now that I'm looking at it is, so the typical background is Queens. It's a very ugly and sterile place. And then you have this huge park in the middle of this ugly place of miles of green spaces that's beautiful and it's open to the public and anyone can just go in there for the day and walk around you have a mini zoo that was like four dollars to get in it was like very affordable and then it was also the site of the u.s open that's where the tennis and uh -huh. the new york mets so that's why i used to spend a lot of time there um, to go see the underdog the mets you know and so listening to what mars was saying because I couldn't understand this exhibit at all. I was just like, there's a lot going on here. I really can't get past it. I'm listening to everyone's input. Yeah. Now I'm thinking it's, it's like nature saying, we want our space back. Oh, you know, like, oh so interesting. There, so interesting. You see the backdrop. You can yeah. see all around it is so ugly. You know, I lived there for 27 years. I think, I think, um, those observations are especially uh, interesting because 
they don't match the artist's intention. And I always say this, that, that art, I mean, we, artists are, in, in today's world, in the contemporary world, we're required to have artist statements and to really be able to speak articulately about what we're doing, almost as if we're engineers. And, and I th most of the artists I know have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> and if they do, I feel like there's something wrong and they don't get the point of being an artist, but that, that, and there's, there are a lot of artists who really believe faithfully that they're the progenitor of meaning, that they establish it. Yet, and this is another reason I love public art, because it opens, again, opens ourselves up to our own experiences. And it's really fascinating that you are from Queens and that you know this spot. And so your interpretation of it really relates to a very personal, intimate experience with this space. And I love that. And so art, the artists, even if they have intention, are not in control of what happens, particularly in the public sphere, of, of how people interpret things. So thank you. Terry. Um, thanks, Paula. I'm Terry. And this is awesome. This is really cool, the way you're doing this. this the first thing I thought of was one thing that, that's a long time ago, and everyone has made wonderful comments about all the pieces. So where I'm, where I'm right now is, it, I can't get whitewash, um, Tom Sawyer, um, uh -huh. Mark Twain. And it's, it's a little bit of a scam that Paul is running on us in the same way that Tom Sawyer did. How he got someone else to whitewash. <laughs> this is Paula's way of doing a two hour speech without doing a two hour speech. Well, of course. It's a scam. It occurs to me that all of this energy is being built up. And, how many of us have come to a session like this and just sat and listened to me talk for two and a half hours? And how boring is that? Like, we, they already know what they're going to say. We sort of already know what they're going to say. Like, how fun is this? There's nothing. I'm not changed by that. So I'm being changed by this moment. And I would not be changed by this piece if we had not had this conversation about this piece. I would get past it. I would consume it. I would assume I knew what it meant in a passing glance. It's not my style of artwork. I don't think it's telling me something that I don't agree with. It's an advocacy. It's an affront to my beliefs. And if I don't agree with it, I'm going to move on. But by having this moment in time, it's just a wonderful opening. It reminds me of a public piece. It is the whiteness, and it's the simple material, and it's something you cannot unsee. I-25 I going north from Socorro, there is Agree with it or not, there are about 25 little white crosses, and it's an advocacy piece. Oh, all yeah. seated, and I don't want to go into what it means or anything like that, because if you don't know what it means, then you know, Google it or whatever. But <laughs> it's something you cannot, I mean, that's in your heart, whether you are for it, against it, or whatever. And, and that, this piece does a very similar thing from my, my experience. I was standing right here. Uh, there's an apocryphal story in my life. When I was one year old, I was in a baby carriage back up Oh, years. my goodness. My father, <laughs> my father is from Puerto Rico, but he grew up in Brooklyn. And we went back. And so I carried this story around with me forever until my father was sort of like, not on his deathbed, but in his final years. And he's, I'm telling the story. He's like, that, that never happened. And I, this was my story. Like, I was at the little church. like, we didn't take you. We left you home at the Curtin's house. You were too late to go to this thing. Oh. And I've been telling the story all my life. Oh. I was in a little fair and a little stroller. It's like, no, you would have just cried the whole time. Didn't you? But, but, and I didn't think of that until you mentioned that, yeah. that, the, that you're from there and all that. So, Paula, thank well, you thank for you for and thank you for sharing that, Terry. It makes me think too, uh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get into this more. That in my experience, most art is a memorial, and public art serves this idea really well because it does memorialize. And so, the idea of memorial actually comes from. Uh, let me get this right. Etymology, monument. Also, it's the same thing as memorial. It comes from German, meaning to remember, and memory. And, and, and often, though, memorials, like this piece here, the gentleman, I believe, I, I think, I mean, I know Julius Caesar is up here on this, in this, in this frieze on the state Supreme Court, as are, like Sophia mentioned, they're all, and, and I know Sophia really well. That's why I remember her name. Jojo, Jojo. Jo -Jo. They're, they're all men, and they're all, they all have something to do with the legal system. Um, 
this piece, the, the, the gentleman on the, on the, from, from our left, it's a very static, rep I mean, do you know who this person was? Do you know what he represented? Do you know what his, his faults were? Do you know uh, what his trauma, personal trauma? I mean, we don't, memory is a really interesting thing. And so uh, thank you, Terry, for pointing that out, that even though public art often has historically, when I say historically, I'm talking like, um, the Renaissance modernism has tried to like freeze this, freeze the idea of memory. And memory in itself is one of the most fluid things that humans have as a resource. And it varies from uh, person to person, from experience to experience. So thank you for reminding us of that. So there's three people who have not gone yet, at least by my calculations. <laughs> you, you, and you. <laughs> Uh, if we can go back to the wedding. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to join the group of, yes, I grew up back east. Oh, sorry. Peg Aguilar. Yes. Thank you. Um, Peg. And my background is environmental design, um, landscape architecture. Ah. Um, currently an artist and almost retired teacher. Um, but yeah, I can remember being little and we're going somewhere, you know, grandma's or my aunt's or whatever. And um, driving by the big globe, and I was like, oh, it was so cool. Um, so when I first saw this, I was like, oh, that's hard. But I think, you know, now that I've had a chance to sit with it a bit, I think it's meant to be horrible. The, the jetty jack, the barrier, the, and just the absence of color in the white pickets is contrasting the give it back, which is nature, which is full of color. Um, so. But it's just, it's disturbing for me to look at. My first impression was, ah, you know? And I think that's probably part of the point, you know? Yeah, and I think too, you know, a lot of, a lot of us were raised on the idea that art is about beautification, and it's, it, that, is a, that can be a component of it. But um, I think if we talk to any artist, they would say the point is, to engage introspectively in who we are. And so the idea of beauty is, um, can, can be simply consoling, which is fine sometimes, for sure. But there's something really poignant about something that is not aesthetically pleasing that allows us to think more broadly about experience. Thank you, Peg. Jojo, <laughs> I got it. That, that was very helpful. Your nickname was very helpful. Okay, two more people. Me? Yes. Uh, I'm Karen. I'm working um, with Joelle and Kathy on the Creative Industries mm -hmm. Initiative. Um, I wanted to, when I saw this one, my, I, I'm, right now I'm reading Blood and Thunder by Hampton Sides, <coughs> which is a book about New Mexico history. Since I didn't grow up here, I need to learn more <laughs> New Mexico history. After 25 years, yeah, I'm finally getting around to that. Um, and my instant reaction to this was that this was about land and land issues and land legalities and land possession issues. Um, probably partly because I'm reading that book, which is all about, I mean, New Mexico's history is a story of the collision between European, Europeans, uh, Mexicans and Native Americans. And, and don't forget the Comanches. Sorry, uh, I'm reading. I'm reading the. I'm reading the Comanche Empire right now. Yeah. Just but fascinating. Yeah. In, the, in yeah. the most awful senses that <laughs> you can think about. So when I see this, I you know I see the immediately the iconic picket fence. I see the the other fence looks to me like one of the stockade fences that they put up around the forts. Mm -hmm. So I get that instant association. And to me, the thing in the middle looks like a rib cage, like skeletal, like a skeleton um, representing the loss of life that sometimes results from land disputes. So Peg, you call it a, you call it a jetty jack, didn't you? Yeah. They, yeah. They, I, I think that they may have been pulling them out. I could be incorrect on that. But they used to be in the river. Yes. Know? And they were part yeah. of the flood control and catching. Right. And that sort of yeah. 
But the best thing you want to go up and pet, you know. I mean, <laughs> at, at some point, Paula will probably Paula is intimately connected to Jenny Jacks because she has a piece of website Saturday right now, which is her own homemade Jenny Jack. Now, okay. So we've, we've been involved in that for a while. I don't know if that will show up in your slide deck. Um, I can't wait to tell you what they're all about. <laughs> okay. One more. Would you like to share? No. Okay, you're fine. Okay, so I'm gonna. I am gonna tell you a little bit about each one. Paul, are you gonna take a turn? Uh, no, because I know about them all. I really well, and I've I've made a lot of comments. Uh, I hope that were some of them were at least one was interesting. So, <laughs> so this is uh, by a Pakistani American artist. Uh, her name is Shazia Sikander, and uh, it is the first female sculpture to join a lineup of carved stone, robed male figures, traditionally used to represent the law. So it's, the material choice is also interesting. I do think it's it's uh, fabricated polyesterine, so foam that's then covered over. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot that's been written about material, materiality in public art, in, I'm sure in architecture um, as well. That there's a lot of interesting ideas about access to an expensive material like marble, like the the, the gentleman on the left is made from, um, and and it is it's absolutely correct in that it it gestures to the cultural reinvestigation of who we are our past, our present, and our future, particularly in response to the role of women in our societies. The sad thing, like I said, though, is it's temporary. And I don't know, I know there's, a, there's an article in Hyperallergic um, by Seth Rodney that was out last May. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a, a Haitian uh, art critic, and he's written a lot for Hyperallergic, hyper which is an online art, mag art magazine. Um, and he talks a lot about and he, ta he actually talked about this piece, and that's how I know it's, it's not permanent, but he talks a lot about how humans are so interested in ourselves. And if you look at most public work, historically, it, is, it represents humans. And he talks about the possibility of maybe, maybe we should start exploring ideas. Um, I think, though, that it's particularly the women's response to this is very critical, and I completely, you know, I, I love the pe people's picking up on the lotus, uh, the, the, the lack of arms, the hair, the power of the hair, the, the feminine figure, all that, it's very interesting. So this piece is really, it's, it's, it's a provocation um, and it uses humor and, and a lot of like uh, sort of double entendres to, is like a secret society access to this piece. Um, it's produced by a group called the New Red Order, which right away makes you think of possibly um, an activist group, a native indigenous activist group. And it's true, um, they are um, um, part of the, 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 the Lenape people who were the original settlers in this area, or, or people, they, they peopled this place in Queens. And, but the name itself actually comes from, so they're, they're working with ideas of how Americans love indigenous peoples, but have never quite, like almost like commodifying that love of indigenous peoples. And the name, the New World Order, is a direct riffing on a 19th century white male group who, I, and I forget the name, something like, it's something like that. It was a secret society where they would dress up as Native Americans. And uh, it was called the Secret, Secret Red Order, something like that, but it's, so it's a riffing on that. Um, and the, the, even the, the play on the word, the word, the world's unfair, directly relates to the world's fair, but also as you know, just you know, common sense tells us that the world is, is unfair in a lot of ways. And it's a, it, it, it parodies the, what they call the propagandistic allure and spect spectacle of world fairs. And I, I think that for, like Terry, in your, your story about your family, your dad, I mean, and I knew your dad very well, as, as one could as a daughter-in-law, who came from Puerto Rico, who lost his dad at five, and who, his mother, the, the mom, raised five kids in Brooklyn all by herself, and he took care of himself. That, that, that for him, to go to the World's Fair was probably 
for a person of color was probably a really um, wonderful marker of he had, in some way he had made it that he was able to bring his family to the World's Fair. It's just, so like these things also take on other, all these other contexts too. But for this particular group, they are definitely part of a group of people who are wanting to activate conversation about unceded territory in the United States and the messy business of that. And could we ever do that as a country? Could we ever give back land to, to peoples? Um, in this book that I'm reading, The Comanche Empire, um, I've often, as a New Mexican, and as a person, uh, those of you who, who know, I mean, Belen is actually a Henisado community. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, what that is. And it's, a, it's basically a combination of Spanish colonial detribalized peoples who were part of um, a massive slave trade. And the interesting thing about the Comanche book that I didn't know, and it, gives, it actually gives, this, this book gives indigenous peoples powers that I really wasn't aware of, that we often think of uh, people of color or women as, as um, needing advocacy. And it's true, that is true. But, uh, but equally, sometimes it condemns those groups of people to a lack of power. And in the Comanche case, I mean, the Comanches were like, they were the biggest human raiders on the planet and had done so before the Europeans arrived. And then when the Europeans arrived, they used the European tools to do even a better job of it. And it's fascinating. And Belen is actually a living uh, legacy of that experience for peoples. Um, and the, the, the picture, or what we, some people have referenced as a painting, is actually a video. And, it's, uh, it's, and this, is, this is also part of this group's work. They've, they invite people who are not indigenous to engage and support the cause of people's right to return uh, of land, land to indigenous peoples. And so there's a, it doesn't show it on here, but the, the majority of it is, and I don't, I don't know this actor, but a white male actor is just basically saying things like, give it back, also don't settle, which is a little, it's a really interesting riff on contemporary corporate uh, speak, don't settle. And, and this is actually what we, what we and those of you who know, like architects and uh, Mars, you seem to guess it, somebody else did too. It's a, it's a settler fence. So it's separating things, separating people. And this is, our, this is now ours. Whereas a lot of these indigenous groups as we know, even the Puebloans, the ancestral Puebloans, were people who were, were, were somewhat, if not completely, like the Comanche and the Apache and the Navajo, very uh, nomadic peoples. So, so anyway, it's like a riffing, but it's, it, there's a lot of humor in it and a lot of sort of secret language about it. And then this one, um, this there's not as much in it except for this. It's that these four, it's, it's a, there's the facade in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and we could imagine at one time what was in those niches probably not unlike this, the New York State Supreme Court building. And so there, and I don't know the history of this. I don't know why those things are gone and why they're gone, but so this became an opportunity for an artist to place some work that is very different from sort of like this dignified, very staid, very solid building. Um, so the one thing, I don't know if I mentioned all three of these, not just the woman, not just now, but all three of them are obviously temporary pieces. And I think that's important too because there is, I mean, I, I love to do permanent public work because it's, it's a big deal and I get to say, hey, that piece is gonna be there forever until the, until the earth blows up, <laughs> until we blow it up. How exciting is that? But there's, I do a lot of, of temporary work and there's something really valuable about it because as humans too, we all, we all, we get, we, uh, Terry's reading a book by Richard Brodigan. Who know, does anyone know who Richard Brodigan was? Tony does, only because Terry told you. Rich, it's a biography. It's a biography. And Terry can speak to this more than I can, because he's reading the book about him. But Richard Brodigan was one of the most famous poets in the United States in the 60s and 70s. And the fact that no one in this room knew who he was. I mean, this guy was making, as a poet in the United States, millions of dollars on publishing his work. 
The fact that none of us know who this person was speaks to the weird cultural loss of memory that maybe, maybe it's specific to Americans. I don't know, it's really fascinating. So in that way too, the things that exist in our environment, often we, get, we, we forget what they were, we lose sight of what they were, and then they take on other meanings, they become territory for other people and other value systems. Um, so temporary work really fights against that, really resists that because it, it is only up for a short time and so piques our attention in a way that maybe is more accurate in terms of human memory. Okay, so I'd like to just briefly talk about public art, what it, what it does, and I've, I've touched on a few of these things already, that art, almost all art is a memorial, is a memory, and that the flaw in some public art in particular is that it lets us down because it, it creates this, this faux uh, idea that things are frozen, that mo memory is frozen in time, and it's not. Memory, is, as we've talked about today, is very fluid, and when we memorialize something like that, we, we actually, it's almost like we, um, we embed it with something that is very distorted. There's nothing, I can't think of anything that's frozen in time. Even my capacity to love another human wavers. Like, in, like I think I have a, we have a, Terry and I have a son together, a 26 year old, and my capacity to love him uh, depends on how often he calls sometimes, <laughs> it, which is fascinating. So my point only being that, that <laughs> sorry, I, I don't, we do love, we adore our child, but the idea of like he's in my head, he's not in my head right now because he's, he's in the US Army and he's out in the field for like three weeks up in Alaska and, and it's kind of nice because I don't have to think about him. I know where he is sort of and, but the idea that it, so something as something that we would think of as like one of the, the the biggest things ethically of value to humans, the idea, the concept of love, even that, I'm here to tell you today, it wavers. <laughs> and how do you pick up on that with something that is public and that is permanent? Um, so the question I have is should public artists examine the concept particularly of community as variable and imperfect, how do we do that? In order to explore a unique representation of mutuality and belonging because things change. Um, Sophia, my dear friend Sophia, is about to graduate from high school. I graduated, she's graduating from Belen High in 2024. I graduated in 1979 from Belen High and I'm, I'm certain very different places. But yet we're all, we're, we're, we get to experience the same, we've gotten to experience sort of the same space in terms of terrestrial landscape and architecture, but very different experiences. And how, do, how does public work capture that? So the real reason I'm here today is to try to, is particularly because there are a lot of creatives, and all of you I think are creatives. How could we imagine bringing some purposeful public art into, com into Belen's community spaces if we agree that, that that's something that we would like to do. Um, and so I'd like to share really briefly four projects, super fast. Two of them are mine, two of them are other people's that are actually public works that, that have happened here in Belen. And then um, I'd like to go into a brainstorming session with us about like some ideas, something, something that we would like to memorialize, to remember in Belen. So this is actually my very first public piece. Um, it was done in 20, 2001, it's called Aquila. And it's, uh, Sophia, you may have seen this because it's up by the high school. It's in the park up by the high school. And I actually never put a plaque on it. I, I think I really, I sort of forgot to do it, and then I was happy that I didn't. And uh, just sort of to allow people to discover something and not be told what it is, and just like, what the hell is this? Why is this up here? Um, the, the project actually, the, the, the call for arts was a New Mexico arts call for a sitting area in this new park. When I was in high school, this area was, had been a dump site and then had been reclaimed, and it was an area that we used to run 
a long distance track practice is in. So I knew the area very well. And now it's a, now it's a really lovely park, a reclaimed dump site as a park. Um, when I design public work, I study you know, in, in a range of communities, history, landmarks, destinations, environments, sorry, to unveil its unique and fluid qualities. And through this process, I like to come up with something that reflects a lo local roots, but also expands our awareness of place. So this piece called Aquila, which references the eagle, which is the mascot for the Belen schools, also references the constellation, the eagle. And I wanted something that um, allowed for, an ex like to think, imagine of, imagine, sorry, an identity around a school district or a mascot, the Belen, Belen Eagles, Los Lunas Tigers, like that, that stuff that we probably all grew up with and, and local, <laughs> local teams fighting against local teams. And at that time, when I was in school, Los Lunas was a, it was a village. It was teeny tiny. We used to beat the crap out of Los Lunas for all of our <laughs> athletic competitions. And, and look how that has changed. Um, but so to sort of like take that idea of territoriality and identity that seems so static a lot of times for humans in our expressions of who we are and, and loft it into space and to connect our planet with somehow the universe to this, this constellation. So the, the layout of this piece is ac actually the, the eagle con or the aquila constellation. Uh, this is a piece that I did last year. It's called Reverse the Curse. And it, it, there, we did it a couple of times in the Belen area, but also it's, the intention was to do it from Taos all the way down to Juarez on all the bridges crossing the Rio Grande. And again, instead of looking at humans, although humans, humans are actively involved in art production and art meaning and art understanding, looking at, reflecting on the Rio Grande River. And one of the interesting things about the Rio Grande is that it has no legal rights to any of her water. And all the water for the Rio Grande is parceled out even before it falls as rain or snow from the sky. And so I thought of um, some type of more like esoteric activist project that asks humans to consider what that means. And I, I had been doing a little exploration on, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a history of curanderisma in my family. And I'd done some research on curanderisma and I came across, I, you know, as a kid, and I think a lot of us, this is actually a very global sort of curse, getting, receiving the evil eye. And often, like when I was growing up, it was something that was given to a young child who was beautiful and considered to be very special. And it was usually an adult who stared at the child too long and it was a curse. And it, it, created, it, it created a challenge and a trauma for that child. That was, that was the theory about the evil eye. And so I started thinking about the river as this very special, beautiful life source, and maybe that's what had happened to it. Instead of all the sort of documented things about like the clear cutting up in northern New Mexico that led to the railroad tracks being built through Belen that then led to the raising of the, the river's bed, which caused all of this prolific flooding throughout the 20th century, which then caused the development of the middle Rio Grande um, Water Conservancy, which then brought in all the jetty jacks to control and straighten that river because according to engineers at the time, nature was inefficient. Mm -hmm. And as a result of all that, the river lost its rights to itself. And so I thought, what could be a remedia for the evil eye? And lo and behold, one of the remedias, as some of you know, is spitting at the victim, which is really fascinating. <laughs> And so I thought, oh, this is a great idea because it, it's, a, it's a, an allegory for an embodied of the body, tithe, of the human body, tithing back to the Rio Grande. And so this, this project was a call to communities along the river to come and spit into the river. So it's called Reverse the Curse. So this project, you, many of you know, this is Judy Chicago, Diamonds in the Sky. Um, I'm not really quite sure. I mean, I know Judy has done for you know forever in her career. She's done these smoke sculptures, and I did try to find some information about w what those were for her. And she calls it environmental art. There's some, definitely been some complications with that um, recently. And 
but I think ultimately this is this is, and you can see it here in her. I mean, uh, what, however you feel about dear Judy, it, her life and her 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 passion for bringing women into the sphere of art, particularly large scale art, is really remarkable. And and it was her 80th birthday, and it's a very it's very much a a, a celebration of that life's work. And who would blame her? It's beautiful, it's amazing. And this is, oops, sorry guys, went the wrong way. This piece some of you uh, maybe participated in uh, with Megan. And um, this is called uh, Live Art Rainbow Exhibit. And it celebrates inclusivity, so. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna pretend like funding is not a concern. We're gonna brainstorm topics for memorials for our community. And we're just gonna put stuff on the board and then sort of see where it goes. And then, uh, so we, um, first we're just gonna brainstorm topics. And then I would like maybe to have people partner up in, in ways that you, do, like you don't know people, et cetera, and uh, figure out these two questions. If we did memorialize this concept, how would you make it happen? It, you don't have to talk about, and I'll, I'll go over this again after we do the brainstorming, but just as a precursor. You don't have to talk about what is it that you're going to do. Just sort of like, what would you think you would need to do to make it happen? And then how would you complete the project? Okay, does that sound good? Good, okay, so we're first just gonna brainstorm topics for a memorial for our community, however you define community, by the way. So a topic for a memorial. Harvey House Girls. Harvey House Girls. Can we define what you mean by memorial? A memory of something, bearing witness to something. Well, at a specific moment in time? Again, we've talked about like, there's nothing that has ever a specific moment in time. Uh, sort of like, so, so embracing the idea that this is all fluid, but you get to say whatever you want. So note that, you get to do whatever you want. Um, I have my, my agenda, which is nothing, nothing is still, this, none of this lasts, all of this too shall die, and uh, this is all a dream. But you get to say whatever you want, whatever you want to memorialize, whatever you want to remember, whatever you want people to, whatever you want to remind people of. Again, I would encourage us to think about this art critic that I talked about, Seth Rodney, who talks about maybe we should start to remember ideas <laughs> instead of humans, because humans are so flawed, and, there's, and it's always going to create territoriality, uh, particularly in this day and age. Okay, so Harvey girls, the Har Harvey it's girls. Not an idea, it's people. Hey, hey, that's fine. That's totally, and I want to say, what, but but whatever you want to say, whatever you want to say. So Harvey girls. Okay, someone else. Adobe. Adobe. Farming. Restoration, buildings. Like, do you have a specific building or just the idea of? Silver Bar Studios. <laughs> Silver Bar Studios, good. I'll take any money. I remember that place. <laughs> just kidding. We bought that building, by the way. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm teasing you, too. I remember There's that place. There's pictures of it somewhere. Yeah. Mm. yeah. You know, it's funny looking at, so, you know, I told you my family lived here and I always thought my family was like, they were like the star of Berlin, but there's not a single picture of any of my family here. Family. family, okay. Oh, this is not, sorry. Crossroads, <laughs> Crossroads good. Which is the real meaning of plazas, by the way. Community. Rob? This is Rob, by the way, guys. Hi, Rob. Hi. Rob, do you have any suggestions? And you didn't? No, I didn't concentrate. Okay. Sorry, Paul. No, you're fine. <coughs> Transportation, maybe? How that affects or affected? 
or will affect future past, present, future. Sophia, do you have any ideas? Something you'd like to remember? Your senior year? <laughs> Your time in the Young Curators Club? <laughs> the best time of my life. OK, we're going to put YCC here. So Sophia and I know each other because we did a, a project together last year called the Young Curators Club. It was a, a group of kids from um, Infinity High School who came together and would, we'd put on shows in the library. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Terry? Birds. Birds. Oh, thank you, Terry. <laughs> yes? More water. More water. Remember, water. Just, just water. water. OK, thank you. The mythology, like you were talking about, these stories that were maybe untold. So digging up the histories of the settlers first. Cool. What was here on that? I, I'm just going to put hidden stories. It's probably not the best, best phrasing, but. It's, for me, it's kind of interesting that come, came here about two, two and a half years ago now and going through the building and some of the artifacts that I found that are these hidden stories you're talking about. It's, it's, I'm intrigued by it. I'd like to learn more. I, I love all these photos. I always love this. So I think the more you understand like where Belen has come from and, and, and you know, through the ages, in fact, its origins, and, and like you mentioned, the peoples that were here before they named it this place, and um, I think that makes it more interesting to me. To, to, I think understanding a little bit more of that to investigate before I would get to a, a point where I had an idea, but I really love the, the history of it, what, from what I do know of it, and that's I think the hidden stories. Is a... Anybody else? Terry? Um, churches, all denominations. Jews, crypto Jews, and Jewish merchants. What's crypto? People who, at a, at a certain point in history, really weren't so uh, open about their Jewishness. So they would change certain spellings. And you can go to the cemeteries and you can see Star of David on, on headstones. And that's like the only time that you ever, oh, that person was Jewish. Persecution, that sort of thing. It's a big part of the history of the too. What I glean from all these photos is the architecture. Nice. The sky and the sun that's here. We would be remiss. It, I was, oh, it, it's funny because when you wrote that, I was going to say we would be remiss if we didn't put the railroad trains. Not that, I mean, it's kind of almost overplayed, but it's big part. One of the things we, I'm oh, sorry, because oh, okay. uh, we're new, kind of to this community and we live in Rio Rancho, but which doesn't really have a downtown, it doesn't really have like a great history of the land. Um, with uh, the cultural like events, like the parades, and the, and they're in a specific location, and at a certain time, and we witnessed if anyone tries to change it, it was big for, so the history maybe, the history of these, Community rituals, community rituals. Yeah, yeah. Sure, rituals, festivals, rituals, um, and how powerful, like how people feel, like 
So um, the history of them and how their family and their grandparents and their great grandparents were, were somehow involved with this. And yeah, legacy is like great work. Mosaic style. This was kind of like our World Fair in Berlin, 1976, the, uh, uh, what was that called? Bicentennial. <laughs> the, the centen centen Bicentennial. Bicentennial. There was only 200 people. <laughs> so it was a huge, I mean, I think all over the country, there were like these, these community things. And, uh, I, and I, was, I was at that time like in ninth grade, and I was part of student council here in Berlin. And so I was involved in all of the activities, all the rituals, and there was a huge parade. I think we affixed it to the, the, the Lady of Berlin Fiestas. And, and I remember I was a monk on the back of a float or something. Okay, I think we have a lot. So I'm thinking we're going we're gonna to just sort of match up. What? We'll, okay. Okay, I have one question before I'm you do that. To. Is this, are, are these ideas in context of this other overarching theme of economic development? Is that, did I hear that in here, or am I making that up? That is a part, that's a deal. That's like a, this symbol could bring some sort of creative capital, or what was the word? Creative industries. Creative is industry. What the, is, the, is the grant that is putting on these, all these different workshops and looking at how creativity and economic development are possibly intertwined and, um, so, yeah. So what I'd like to do, and again, it doesn't have to be like if you, if you and your partner or partners pick, for example, birds. It doesn't mean you have to come up with an idea for a memorial for birds. I'm just asking, how would you go about doing? It? Like, how would you go about like the process, the steps involved of creating a memorial to birds, a memory of birds in the land? So almost more practical rather than creative right now, if that's okay with everybody. What, what would be the steps? Okay. And we have Kathy has uh, generously provided lots of different little art materials. You can come up and get some stuff. Nice. And I would encourage us to partner up with somebody that you don't really know and try some. Teacher. Things. Yes, sir. Can I make a suggestion? <laughs> yes. Give yes. us all a number. All the ones over here, two's over here. That way, it's totally random. Okay. Just go, 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 like go count us all off. Yeah, let's do, let's do four. Let's do yeah, four. just count, start over there, that way they can't pick their numbers. But you have to remember your numbers, yeah. I'm not remembering yeah. them. Don't cheat. <laughs> One, two, eight, no. <laughs> four. I have to leave, I'm sorry. No, start again at one. Oh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Start again at one. Two, three, four. Oh, so you guys are four. One, two, three. Tony, you're four. <laughs> one. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. sorry. You can go one, one, two, three, four. No. So we'll do five. So we'll say you're one again. You're one again. Okay, all the ones, please stand up. One, two. No, you were. You were four. You were four. Oh, one, four. Congratulations. Okay, twos. One, one's over here. Where are my twos at? Four. Okay, everybody, we're going to come back together. And then we point out, and then I'm going to share one last thing. You want to sit back and Yeah, come on. Nicely done. You have to sit with your wrist, though. Yeah, sit with your wrist. Oh, she said it's mandatory. Sit in your group. Oh, so Mary.
the top. Oh, yeah, you put it there. Oh, it's in the group. Mars, 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 you, really you have to sit with your group, it's mandatory. You didn't really give us a lot of time. You had exactly the same amount of time. I know. Right? Right? Um, I thought it was a little bit. I can see the audience now. It's good. Okay, so this is a ruse as well. There's a point to this exercise. And I, I will get to it. I'll get to it after we present. So, uh, I know that this. This committee's already selected a spokesperson, so we can do You don't have to do it like that. Everybody can speak whatever, but we'll just sort of report out like what, what you came up with. And, um, to help draw the other stand up here and talk. You, yeah, you can come up here and talk, or sit back there. Yes, yes, for sure. Okay, so first we started with like an observation, so we wanted to do ours with, on like, the nature kind of aspect of like, the nature things that we put up there. So like water and that, and then uh, we would want to put a, together like a group of people, a champions group, basically um, people with the same idea as us, like the same goal to make this memorial. And then um, we put together like a, a statement, I guess, like a case statement, like what idea we're trying to portray and like why we wanted to memorialize this thing. And then we're gonna pick a location, like maybe a business, maybe like a high traffic area, something like that. We'll pick a location and then uh, we'll have a selection committee to help find a Valencia County artist. And that's not limited to people that live in Valencia County because they're saying there's people that own businesses in Valencia County. It's just um, like uh, artists that, you know what I mean? Anyways, and then after we find out artists, we'll be able to expand with their ideas of what they want to do. So that's basically it. Oh. I've always feel Terry always tells me I always tell them the punchline too soon, so I become very paranoid about that. <laughs> um, but there, I just, I just think, wouldn't it be amazing if we could have some public art, like permanent or temporary, in Belen, and there are avenues for it that actually we have not taken advantage of in Belen that are available to us. One of them, and I, I really like that you guys really focus on Valencia, is that they're in New Mexico. Well, first of all, New Mexico was the first state, Albuquerque, first city in the United States, that actually started a public art program. And so basically what they're doing is they're taking 1% of funding for uh, public buildings, and, and that's where they create the fund to, to create this, these public art, either temporary or permanent. And um, I mean, and now you see New Mexico. There's lots of counties. Santa Fe. I mean, Santa Fe is a very different place, of course. They have Bernalillo County. It's very different, large. Los Alamos County. Um, some counties in the south um, that have public art programs, and it would be really. And, it, and so it's a way for people to leverage growth that's not exclusive to one town in that county. And I think it would be, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a Valencia County Public Art Program yeah. to leverage all that money that Los Lunas is generating? And I think too, they also like there's some tax. There's, I mean, obviously, it's, I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney and uh, you know, and a tax attorney and all that, but there's, there's different ways that people do it. It's not just for funding that they get for a building, but it's also tax dollars, and they figure out how to appropriate and how to, how to manage that. And it, and it actually. As Joelle talked about at the beginning of our visit, it does, it, there's so much evidence that this certainly can be blamed for gentrification. I don't think that Belen is in a position to, to get into an ethical argument about gentrification. I think that there is a lot of concern about our community and, and economics in the country that we live in is a huge part of that, that formula. And it, wouldn't it, so it would be amazing if there was a Valencia County Public Art Program. And um, I think, you know, hey, they, Viagra was able to get more water, why can't, you know, the community yeah. decide to come up with a public art program? And I think that there's some really interesting people in, in here today who have some really uh, interesting backgrounds and connections that could possibly start a conversation about that. 
I like the idea. I, one of the, the things that I thought was great when I first moved here was just the notion that um, if I wanted to do something, I could just take it upon myself and do it. And, and that's happened in a, a lot of places all around town. You can see, you know, there's that train that's up by the post office, there's Kelly's house, there's my house, where somebody just took it upon themselves and they didn't have to ask anybody, nobody had to approve it, or we just did it. Yeah, and I think that's great, you know, because then, then you start to get everybody, everybody's personality and, you know, what they feel they want to memorialize. Yes, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I like our approach to public memorial. Anarchy? Is that what that is? <laughs> Art anarchy. There you go. Yeah, no, What's the train by the post office? Sorry. What's the train? It's when you go through the drive through for the post office. Oh, it's on the wall. Oh, it's on the wall. Yeah, I got you. yeah, the train. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that house is for sale, right? <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, didn't that, didn't that wall get knocked down? It or did, and they put up a metal fence. Yeah. It was real. But part of the train is still there on the west side. Yeah. Sounds like a metaphor or something. <laughs> Well, that's, Thank you. That, that's kind of something I see coming from the few meetings I've been with the with the cultural, you know, development thing. I, I was just waiting to see that become a thing or a topic for discussion of a, an arts council or a, a thing for this area. I just think it's something that's going to naturally evolve because of the interest in this town and the people right. coming in and wanting yeah. to do it. It seems like a natural progression. You know, it does. Sure. Poet Laureate, mm -hmm. Arts Council, mm -hmm. and then an anarchy. Damn. <laughs> and Just grants. leave a little room for a little. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Artist grants. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, another group? Us? Okay. Um, we talked about nature also and creating sort of a hybrid of a sculpture garden approach and planted areas throughout town um, that would become pollinator and bird habitats. Oh, yes. And one uh, specific site we were thinking about also is Willy Chandra's Park that's mm. still abandoned. Right. And yeah. that just who does it sit I, right with any of those? I mean, who is considered to be the Rio Grande? It's been a little yeah. Grand. Yeah. 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 I know. It's fraught with yeah. politics and economics, yeah. but that would be a great place to have as a uh, centerpiece for this idea. And then people would, you know, could be promoted. People could come down and, in the spring or whatever and tour these natural areas of wildflowers and also look at the other installations that would somehow be combined with them. So our to-do list was um, identify the space, come up with a basic design or concept, at least for the central piece, uh, engage stakeholders, as many and as varied as possible, uh, because they might then need to weigh in on the design concept so that we don't end up with a lot of fighting afterwards. Um, figuring out funding, the cost of installation, the cost of ongoing maintenance and repair, and then identification of the artists. Um, th th this reminds me of a, the first part reminds me of a, the up in Los Lunas, at, and I don't, I'm sure this area has a designated name, but it's, what, it's the River Park. It's, on the south side of the bridge, there's a really uh, cool installation that UNM architecture students, and I think architecture environment, environmental art students made using um, um, cut down, cut Chinese elm, Siberian elm. Mm -hmm. And it's a really cool structure. I think it may serve a flooding purpose. I think there may be some, some practical aspect to it too, but <coughs> It's, and I thought, how did you know? How does a relationship like that happen? That's such a cool thing. That, and it's a permanent piece there. That UNM, University of New Mexico, got involved in the city of Los Lunas, along with the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, to put a piece like that. What does it look like? 
it, it feels like a structure, like an architectural piece. Yeah, have, it's have, you seen landscape architecture. have you seen people using bottles or cans? Yes. And then concrete bottle, concrete bottle. Yeah. Like the glass. Imagine a Chinese on log, concrete Chinese on logs cut this much. So instead of bricks, log, 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 just oh, a wall. Okay. Cool. It's really, it's really cool. It's really cool. So cross sections of yeah. the wood. Okay. Uh, eighteen inch long oh, blocks. Nice. Okay. Of wood. Yeah. Interesting. Sort of an adobe. Yeah, like some kind of structure. You can't enter it, but it's a structure. It's just, it's a, it's a cool, it's an interesting looking object. And, it really is. And there is, a, there is a plaque on it, like with the University of New Mexico. And, um, anyway, hmm. I think of, um, there's an organization in New Mexico, it's actually run by a single woman, Annie Hanna, like single editor, but she's not married. It's her thing, it's her, it's her activist thing. It's called New Mexico Echo Justice Organization. And she's, she's been a huge part of the conversation. She was a huge part of the conversation with uh, the Yates um, designation of the property up in the communities. Also for um, uh, Niagara, Niagara, Niagara. And it's just really fascinating to me how there's all these sort of like, in New Mexico, there's all these different entities that work really hard at what they do. But there's, I, maybe because of the size of our state, there's so much potential for people interacting with each other and coming together to create some solution or this movement towards the positive in communities that is not being quite leveraged or people are busy or whatever. Anyway, it's interesting. Anybody else? You guys? Can I say something about their project? Yes. This is really for um, Kathy and the arts team, et cetera, because you talked about Richard Rodgers. You guys should consider doing an homage to Richard Brodigan and do a reprise of his project called Plant This Book. Countercultural people may remember this concept of Plant This Book. And he, this guy was kind of a goofy, goony guy, but then he was considered super hip. But he just came up with this idea. And he, and he planted this book and he'd give it away for free. And he just basically took a bunch of seeds, put it in a little packet, put this in the title of the book was called plant this book and give it away to all these kids and kids were planting it around San Francisco, North Beach in the late 60s, early 70s. And they did it a couple times. He says they did like 15,000 of them and they're like, no, it was more like 2,500, but whatever it was. And then they did it again in like the 90s, somebody did it. And but it's just a simple little project. It's not copywritten or anything like that. Did it have seeds in it? Yeah, yeah, the seeds are in the package. The, the kids get the book, and inside the book is a Richard Brodigan poem that it, it could be poems by local poets. And then inside the poem, it's one poem. You read the poem, you say, that was awesome. You dig a hole in the ground, you stick it in the ground. And you put it, and if they grow or they don't grow. You know, seeds yeah, are. Yeah. If you don't water, it's not going to grow. But it's a, it's a literacy, agricultural beautification, public art guerrilla project. This is so like, the books, ban the books. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like seed bombs. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. A, yeah. There's a, yeah. Um, but it's got the little poetry. I love that you guys, you know, are like thinking about creating a community other than humans, too. Well, plus the humans. They can come and make it things. <laughs> so are they, are they, uh, Indigenous plants, like, are they? Oh yeah. What if they're, what if they're like the Russian sage? Like, yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. You no, know, it has to be burn books and. The no. question is, <laughs> and they absolutely went and they they yes. tried to get plants that were indigenous yes. to the San Francisco Bay Area that would thrive and that would yes, yeah, spell that yes. way. Packets go heads. Yeah. Go heads. Tom <laughs> already did that. Yeah. Planting the packets of benzene in my red plastics. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Paul. My bad. Oh, no, it's great. Back to the Russians gave us tumbleweeds. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Tony. Yeah. We didn't. Uh, we didn't talk too much specifically about any of the projects. We kind of intuitively knew it was we had to go through these steps, and we thought the first step would be to create a mission statement for the design and put it out for artists. And then we would, uh, the second step would be to advertise for artists to participate. Then uh, research permitting and land use for the site that we had envisioned for the piece. And then we'd 
look into funding, different funding sources, which kind of comes off of who would be involved with this action uh, later on. Then we're going to, we felt we'd have to look at maintenance and security and safety issues. Um, you know, looking at your project out at Eagle Park. When I saw that immediately, I thought, yeah, there's some structure involved in putting those heavy rocks up <laughs> on top of here. So safety would be a concern. Uh, then we'd have to... Stance engineering drawings. Yeah, yeah I suspect <laughs> that you have those. <laughs> uh, then we'd have to select a selection committee, put them together to review the artwork that is being submitted. <clears throat> We're assuming that this would be a competition so we could open it up to any artist, not just say, you're the artist for this project, you know, or we want to put it out there. Uh, then we'd have to establish a timeline for finishing the, the piece of work and really a timeline for submittals. Uh, after it was all done and our piece was selected, we have to go on a promotion campaign for the art through social media and radio and what have you, newspaper and what have you. And then uh, how we get this done, who we have involved, uh, we thought it we would want this in our Main Street district because Main Street is kind of the one supporting this group backing up the arts and establishment of the arts and culture district. So being that it would be in our district here, uh, we get the city of Berlin involved, then the arts and culture district involved, this new entity that's being formed, and then the uh, Berlin Main Street partnership, and the Berlin Ugly. So those would be the players involved with how we get it done. So some little bit details. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> We're kind of a plan. <laughs> <laughs> you said practical. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, you did. I appreciate the varied responses. Well, uh, yeah. One thing, and I've talked to Kathy about this a couple times, um, and um, is that this, the, the city of Berlin actually has is supposed to have access to funding from from New Mexico from the state government from the from the New Mexico Cultural Affairs Office because. You, we just planted two new buildings in Berlin, and it's the firehouse and the courthouse. And I don't know. I mean, I think it it would it could be simply you know a group a group of people communicating with the New Mexico Arts in Public Places group, which are very open, and or with with the head of New Mexico um, Cultural Affairs, who's Michelle Flom Childs to say, hey, we just have these two buildings, we, we want to do something. And, I mean, it's, uh, those steps that you have there are really specific to getting something like that started. And it would just, I mean, it would... Uh, For a second, go a long way, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that there are, there, not that it wouldn't be without its challenges, I do think that it could, as Joel talked about, it could bring a community together. It, it's a really, uh, just because I've done it numerous times for different communities, it really is a beautiful thing. It's like, it's whatever the topic is, it, it creates this moment to, of togetherness in a community that begins a life of its own. And it makes a place look nice. It, it somehow inspires people to do other things that are creative, anarchic or not. <laughs> and. Um, it just, it, it really can bring a community together in a really beautiful way. And again, spawns like so different different creative movements that are really healthy for a community. And if this, I mean, I think that it's a, it's sort of unfair that you, that this, the city of Berlin has these two huge buildings and no one is access, accessing those funds. And if it's not accessed, it will be lost. It could already be lost. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I don't know what to say because I'm not a government person. I'm just, I'm just an artist who is very anarchic. <laughs> but I just, it just seems like, like now is the time for somebody to come together and call up the state and say, hey, we have these two buildings. We would like to do a public call. There's one other idea I have, have for us too, but we'll finish. So thank you for that, for those details. Okay, you guys. I'm supposed to talk about you know.
the girl was kind of scared. Oh, it was his girls. idea. <laughs> when, um, I think we, we pretty much covered everything that we also tagged. Um, one thing I think uh, that you already touched on was location and the history. I think that's a really, even if we're talking about something that's not related to, I think that's super important and really interesting to wherever the location is, in addition to whatever the topic is, to somehow pull history. Um, we talked about materials and how if the idea, it, let's say it's our fruit, but we want to fabricate something in metal, was that you had to consider that fabricator helping you come up with a piece, and that relates back to the time limit. Or uh, we were talking about like a competition. Um, there's, always a, there's always a deadline. Um, Bob had a piece that had a deadline, and like, what, days, a week before the deadline, the piece fell apart. It was this giant armadillo of Bob's head or something. <laughs> and the materials felt, you know, there was a material issue. So he had like a certain amount of days, and this is an outdoor sculpture competition. He won, which is super cool. <laughs> but he had a crisis right beforehand, so the time is always of essence. The funding you all talked about, um, the architect, the special skills that kind of relate back. Because what can you do what, if, if this is our group, you know, you have to utilize each person's specialty. Put me in charge of writing or social media, I'm out. Artist statement, I'm out. Like, you know, <laughs> identity stuff. But, um, yeah, I think you guys covered everything. I like the mission statement idea. But I love the idea of going back to that memory or the, you know, uh, memento mori. Like, what are we memorializing? Because it's easy to get caught up in, like, the thing. Um, or our artistic skills, but I, I think that's really, I've learned so much today, so thank you. So um, I want to show you a slide, and, and if you all want access to these websites, we can figure out how to do that. But, um, so the slide has, has a, you know, the New Mexico Arts and Public Places program, um, which is under the umbrella of New Mexico Cultural Affairs Department. and. Um, then there's a particular project that New Mexico Arts and Public Places do, does that is really interesting. It's called Time. They're temporary uh, installations. And they, the, the state, again, I don't know how this exchange begins. I don't know what catalyzes someone, some, some community to talk to the state and say, hey, we want this. And I don't know what the requirements are for the state to say, um, okay, you want this? Let's, this let's, let's engage in a conversation, and these are the parameters. But all over the state of New Mexico, there are communities who have come together um, in the context of something celebratory that the community does. And I've been a part of it. I've been an artist that's been selected on a couple of these temporary installations. And so it's under the umbrella of something that the community is already doing. Like for us, it could be the Mantanza or Rio Abajo Days, something that's already already existing. And it's just another layer to bring more people to our community and to, to celebrate and to create a moment in time again that people are coming together to do something. And it definitely, I think, would impact um, bringing people to Belen for the celebration and also um, possibly guiding some type of economic development within the context of businesses, et cetera, who are participating in the celebration. So the communities come together, they have this, whatever it is, this, this event, this ritual, and they approach the state, the Mexico Arts and Public Places, and says, we want to do one of these time installations. And the state provides the funding for it, and um, I think now it's like t typically like, this, this, the community would select, I think, five to ten artists to come in and do a temporary installation, talking about whatever it is that we wanted to memorialize. And business owners would, business owners and government entities would sponsor a site in in the town for these things to happen, or like a, a range of sites, like it could be along Becker, different businesses along Becker, or along Main Street, and. Artists would be selected, and they would get paid um, a nice a nice rate. I think now it's like about five thousand dollars to create this temporary installation. What was one of the time projects that you did? Um, the, the most recent one I did was at Bosque Redondo at Fort Sumner, and it was a celebration of um, 
the long walk by the Diné uh, that were taken to Fort Sumner, and it's just, I mean, the, the, your, the, the, the book, I'm sure, talks about this. Um, um, and just the, cha the chaos and the bureaucracy and just the mess of all of that. But now there is, there's a museum in Fort Sumner dedicated to remember, remembering the long walk of the Diné. So the, what the project I did was I, I um, partnered with Navajo schools in New Mexico, with middle schools and high schools. It was during COVID, too, that this happened. And also um, schools in Fort Sumner, which are not necessarily Navajo at all, but just folks, kids who are, whose parents are probably working for the government or farmers, et cetera, ranchers, et cetera and coming together to, to talk about what does it mean to be a contemporary Diné person today? What does that look like? And so there was a lot of exchange online with kids that did this, and then we, and then, then we all did artwork, and then we created um, these massive kaleidoscopes with the artwork in it, and people walked up to the kaleidoscope and turned the kaleidoscope and saw these images. It was amazing. I mean, it was, yeah. was mind-blowing. It was fun. It was a really I mean, cool. it's but it was temporary. Yeah, and in that way too, like I think that public art does bring people together in a way that, and I do studio work that studio work could never do. You know, it's just it's very isolating in that way, but uh, it's really exciting. It's like really amazing to be able to engage with other humans and talking about these larger ideas and, and complications of being a human. Uh, but, but I think that would just be a really, what a fun thing. I mean, it would be like a festival. And, and there could be, uh, there was another time I did like a sound piece. So it was all like, there were like, like lots of experimental things that I've done that I necessarily wouldn't do for a gallery or for, or for you know, permanent public work. But, um, and I was not from any of these towns. But it could be something that a committee, a local selection committee would encourage local artists to um, pursue to, to, to make a proposal and then you guys we, we would select them select them and then we would have this big festival and this art would be there and it would be very celebratory so it's called time and then uh, one other thing I wanted to share was the the fulcrum fund grant for any of any of you anarchists who do need funding <laughs> I applied for that twice I guess you don't have enough enough money to be an anarchist. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that's up in, that's an Albuquerque, Albuquerque related 516. But I have all these, I can show you the slide. I don't think it's necessary to show you the slide. I can give these to, to Joelle and Kathy and, and it can be emailed out. So, yeah. Actually, the, that's not the one I applied for. The Arts in Public Places. Okay. Yeah. That one. Um, must be super, I, I don't know. Because I met Olivia Michaels and she got in. What, did, what was it for? Was it the purchase of existing art? I was like, was okay. it purchase of existing work that one? Or? Yeah, and you could, it was like they had a lot of money, hundred thousand dollars maybe or something, but you could only submit a piece five thousand and under. Yeah, um, and it was for in public places, and it did have some restrictions, you know, of course, because it, it would go in a bank or it might go in a hotel um, or a government facility or something. So it did have some restrictions um, about. You know, obviously, nothing offensive or nothing racist or nothing. You know, all those kind of things. Yes. Yeah. It's a yeah. That's an art, that's one of those. Oh, okay. So they, that's another. So that's another program that they do. That's not related to fulcrum fund. That's a whole different. That's a whole different. Yeah. So that is another program that New Mexico Arts and Public Places okay. do. And if any, if anyone wants any support with that, I. I can I can personally offer support okay. for that. It could be about image, you yeah. know. I love that. And it's also it's also uh, Terry and I talk about this a lot. Terry is a poet. There, because of the digital world, it, everything has become so much more competitive. Mm -hmm. And imagine that you're one of these agencies that are very in, in their in house are very underfunded. They have maybe you know two people in office mm -hmm. and an admin person. Going through thousands of it's just it's, it's insanity. It's insanity. So um, I would suggest just keep trying when they when they open it up. Just keep trying. Yeah. Okay. The other thing too is you can get a yes, like yes you got in, but then they and they take it like a 
like a trunk show over the state of, throughout the state of New Mexico and say, hey, would you like a piece? And, and the community's like, we like that piece. And they're like, well, you can't afford that piece. <laughs> and so even though you were selected, you may not be chosen for, for something. I had a piece that was picked up by the Uni University of New Mexico Engineering Department. Mm. Uh, but after probably a couple of failed attempts, too. Mm. So it's a rejection. Yeah, it's, I know. <laughs> that should be a theme. Right. <laughs> Let's go. See, that's a great idea. Too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Take it back. Yeah. Take it back. <laughs> The red group, they, and that thing, one of their things is, they, they keep saying, don't settle, don't settle. Uh, okay. Well, thank you guys for coming.